Sure. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for all for coming along. Um, David Luke. Uh, the title of my talk was actually something like um, Psychedelics and Anomalous Experience, but I'm just recycling an old talk, which hopefully you haven't heard, and the title was pretty similar. It was uh, Psychedelic Consciousness, Exceptional and Transpersonal Experience. So, you know, exceptional experience or transpersonal experiences, it's just another way of saying anomalous experience, okay? So, um, anomalous has its own connotations. I'm going to put it this way. It doesn't matter too much about that. Um, so, I'd just like to say, well, thank you very much to the organizers for putting on this event. Um, in the UK, we organize a conference every two years called Breaking Convention, uh, and it's quite a, a big conference. We've got about 700 people. Um, and about 120 presenters over three days. So I know what it's like to put on an event, and it's really nice to come to somebody else's conference and not have to worry and just kick back and enjoy yourself. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so this is the university I teach in uh, Greenwich in London. I teach in the psychology department, and I teach a course called the Psychology of Exceptional Human Experience. So that includes psychedelic experiences, paranormal experiences, mystical experiences, out-of-body experiences, all kinds of anomalous experiences or transpersonal experiences, okay? But I use this title, Exceptional, because it, it covers everything and it has no real connotation, no baggage. And uh, so I'm interested in how particularly these experiences come about through altered states and especially through the use of psychedelic substances. Um, Stan Groff, you probably all know, did quite a lot of work in, in kind of mapping the terrain of these extraordinary experiences and he broke them down into three basic types based on a kind of survey of uh, 45 different types of experiences that he encountered within several thousand LSD psychotherapy sessions. Uh, the first one is the experiential extension of space-time, oh, sorry, experiential extension within space-time and consensus reality. So those are those experiences which don't defy any of the kind of common conceptions of the known laws of physics and reality, okay? So these may be experiences of planetary consciousness, where you get to feel what it is like to be, you know, think globally, if you like, embryonal, fetal, and phylogenetic experiences. So these don't necessarily defy any of the concepts about reality that we ordinarily have, but they may be pretty wild experiences. The second time is exper experiential extension beyond space-time, and consensus reality. And this is where my real interest comes in. Uh, I'm a parapsychologist as well as a psychologist, so I'm interested in the transcendence of space and time. So those kind of experiences like mediumship, where people apparently communicate with spirits of the dead, or entity encounters, which are very common on DMT, or experiences of cosmic consciousness, or also psychic experiences like telepathy and precognition, predicting the future. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about those. And then there's the third type as well, which are those transpersonal experiences of a psychoid nature. And he took this term from Jung. And those are those having apparent physical concomitants. So he included things like physical mediumship, uh, where people, you know, make ectoplasm or maybe a, a trumpet will be played mysteriously by a discarnate entity, apparently. Uh, UFO phenomena, yogic cities. So the manifestation of things in, in a physical form. Um, I'm not going to deal with that one quite so much. Um, so in my own area of research, I've been doing this for about 10 years, I've published papers the last 10 years on, on various areas, and these are the areas I'm covering. Well, I'm literally covering because I keep standing in front of it, but I'm sorry about that. Uh, synesthesia, which actually falls into the first category, that's within uh, space-time reality, okay? Uh, then we have, moving on to the second category, things like extra-dimensional percepts, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, entity encounters, alien abduction, sleep paralysis, which could also come into the first category, interspecies communication, i.e. communication between humans and other organisms, uh, such as plants or animals, uh, possession, and my main area is psi, so telepathy, precognition, predicting the future, and clairvoyance. Uh, I don't really deal with psychokinesis. This doesn't happen very often with psychedelics. So I've published a whole bunch of papers on that in the last 10 years, which you can read, um, you can probably find if you go to my, oh, it's not on there, uh, academia.edu, you can get most of my papers on there. Um, 
but I'm not going to talk about all of those things. I am trying to, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview, so it's going to be quite a condensed talk. We'll see how that goes. I'm going to talk, start talking about synesthesia and extra-dimensional percepts to begin with, and I'll finish off with a bit about psi, and I'll skip most of the rest of the stuff in the middle. So it'll be like a weird sandwich, okay? Um, so a survey we did, and some data from experimental research in the field with people on ayahuasca, just looking at the kind of the prevalence of these kinds of experience amongst people who take psychoactive drugs, and particularly amongst people who take psychedelics. So we have the kind of most common experiences at the top here, down to the, the least common at the bottom. So we see, particularly under the influence of ayahuasca in this first column, that uh, substance entity encounter experiences are very common, where people encounter the spirit of the plant or the chemical they've consumed. Less so with chemicals, more common with plant uh, psychedelics. Uh, universal unconsciousness, uh, consciousness, sorry, out-of-body experiences, uh, entity encounters, telepathy, clairvoyance, uh, death, rebirth experiences, communication with the dead, and then down at the bottom we have precognition, which is a little bit unfortunate because most of my experimental research is on precognition, but we still have about 25 percent of ayahuasca users reporting precognition under the influence and maybe only about 20 percent of people taking other kinds of psychedelics reporting these experiences but they're still relatively common especially when you compare it to experiences under non-psychedelic drugs so you ask people about you know experiences with um, prescription drugs cocaine heroin alcohol caffeine they don't really have these kinds of experiences under the influence of these drugs so it's something very specific to psychedelics, which give people these extraordinary experiences. Um, people do have them spontaneously, but these are the last column is people's kind of the general occurrence of these experiences. But this is across people's entire lifetime. So what we find is people have a lot more of these experiences actually under the influence <coughs> of psychedelics. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, entoptics, and I'm going to move on to synesthesia. Um, You'll know what entoptics are. This is one of the names for them. These uh, geometric patterns that people see uh, in altered states of consciousness, particularly under psychedelics, but also under hypnosis, uh, in uh, hypnagogia, between waking and sleeping. And these uh, geometric patterns that occur everywhere. Um, first studied by um, Helmholtz, he gave the name entoptic, meaning coming from within the optic system, i.e. somewhere between the eye and the visual cortex. But I think this isn't necessarily the case. I think, it, that, I think we can, uh, there's a good argument that these things aren't necessarily entoptic as they're defined. And so I prefer to use the, the term developed by Kluver from his research with mescaline, and he called them form constants because they have a particular form, either spirals or geometric forms, hexagons or whatever. And they, are, they have this constancy. They, 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 are, they have a constant appearance. There's another terminology that's quite similar to this as well as phosphenes, but these really are made within the eye. You can find that out by just sticking your finger in, in your eye, or my eye even, but preferably your own, and you'll see these um, strange geometric patterns. And this is a, an artist's impression of what those kind of things look like. But they really are just uh, effects, physical effects, on your rods and cones in your eye. Uh, the more elaborate experiences people have are from these uh, geometric forms which you see in altered states. And Kluver categorized them into, into uh, six basic types. But these are the kind of the general gist of it. Uh, it was in the 1970s that Raikul Dolmatov, an anthropologist in Colombia working with the Tucano Indians, uh, discovered, uh, kind of use ayahuasca, and he discovered that they use these, uh, they have these particular form constants in all their artwork, as we find with a lot of indigenous groups who use psychedelics or engage in shamanic practices. Um, so this is some examples of some of the Tucano artwork. This one is a, this is a vision uh, from uh, Yahe from ayahuasca. A big central cross represents a vagina, and the circles in it are the flavor of semen. Um, this is from the Tucano. So not only do you have like, uh, this geometric images, but you also have uh, synesthesia, which I'm going to come to in a minute, this blending of the sensory experiences. 
I've been lo working a lot with the Buradika, the Wicholi in, in, Can in so Canada. No, I haven't been working with them in Canada. In Mexico, in fact. Um, where am I? Berlin, OK. Uh, they've been using uh, peyote cactus for, we, we suspect, about at least 5,000 years. And they make all this very beautiful artwork where they incorporate these geometric patterns and also the, the peyote itself into their artwork. You can see that here. Um, they use these very small beads. And you see it's got a, a very geometric form to it. It incorporates these form constants into their artwork. This is some of their traditional work they do. They turn everything into kind of geometric art forms. This one is not so traditional, uh, but I think you get the, the same idea. Uh, I can't imagine what their inspiration for their artwork is, um, but it's very much driven by their use of uh, peyote. So in the 1980s, um, archaeologists in the field of rock art research suggested that uh, all the Paleolithic rock art, which we see with these, uh, has these form constants in it. And it, it was a kind of overriding theory put forward to explain rock art that it was, a sh it, was, it was due to shamanic practices, people going into an altered state of consciousness in a cave, and they would literally sketch on what they saw onto the rock, uh, perhaps under the influence of uh, hypnagogic influences, perhaps in the darkness, half awake, half sleep, perhaps <coughs> eating some kind of magic mushroom. Um, or through breathing, or some other shamanic practice. I put forward by Le Lewis Williams and Dowson, and they showed that uh, if you look at all the different uh, rock art from different places, you, they have this entoptic forms within them. All these form constants are consistent throughout. And here's, oops, skip that one. Here's some examples. I've completely forgotten where that rock is, but it's kind of irrelevant. You can see how it conforms to these... Uh, form constants. And we see the use of this in the artwork of lots of psychedelic using indigenous groups, such as the Shipibo here. You can find some lovely Shipibo artwork on the stall outside there. Um, <clears throat> and what's even more interesting about this is that they also incorporate uh, elements of synesthesia into their artwork. Now, it's said, and there's many things said about Shipibo artwork, but uh, that this some people say that this represents uh, the, the songs the shamans sing under the influence of ayahuasca, which they actually see. So under the influence of the, the psychoactives, you begin to see sounds, perhaps. You begin to have this blending of uh, sensory experience, which we call synesthesia, um, which I'll come back to. So Lewis Williams and Dowson suggested there's this uh, a kind of formulaic pattern in which people have altered states of consciousness. You start out at the beginning, there's th three basic stages. You have these form constants or entoptics, then they take on more iconic form. They become snakes or anarchist bombs, apparently. And then you travel through a tunnel and you meet a fox in a, in a dinner jacket. Uh, <laughs> or you meet these uh, theranthropic forms, these kind of fusions of animals and, and people. Um, and they take on a kind of supernatural quality. The, the visions evolve. And this is a kind of a, a rather gross way of, of, a kind of crude way of, of considering alt states of consciousness, especially when neither Lewis Williams nor Dowson ever professed to having an altered state of consciousness other than, you know, going to sleep at night or having a cup of coffee. So, that, you know, they're talking from a very much an academic position. Not everybody goes through these uh, tunnel experiences. Not everybody sees these form constants. But, you know, some of the elements are, are, are right. I won't, I've just explained all that already. Excuse me. Um, but the basic idea of Lewis Williams and Dowson, this is a good example of, um, you know, science envy, how archaeologists have become obsessed with trying to impress their colleagues in, in neuroscience and, and adopting a kind of perhaps a faulty or presumptuous philosophy about mind-body relationship. So they basically said these experiences are occur universally in altered states, these form constants, which yes, they do in many different altered states, but not for everybody. Um, that our ancestors used these uh, techniques of altered states, which yes, they probably did. Archaeological evidence suggests, you know, peyote, for instance, has been used for 5,000 years at least. 
Um, they then suggest that these, the rock art represent these altered states of consciousness, which, you know, I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair hypothesis, you know. Um, and they said the explicit content of the experience varies with the cultural context, which, yes, it probably does. They said the basic features of the experience are repeated and are hardwired into the human nervous system. This is a bit where I kind of tend to disagree with them, you know, because, well, last time I looked, we're not robots, you know, we're not, we're not actually machines. Um, that's a, a metaphor perhaps we can use, but, you know, Lewis Williams and Dawson talk about this hardwiring over and over again, but it doesn't really have much meaning. And I'll, and I'll say why I think that is. <clears throat> okay, so, you know, the basic, if you try and understand perception, uh, visual perception, for instance, it's, it's a great mystery. We have uh, light coming in, uh, electromagnetic waves, uh, or photons, if you like, and it hits the eye, and it, it it travels along to the, to the back of the eye, and then it gets transduced into electrochemical signals which travel to the back of your brain, your visual cortex, and then this is the bit we can't really explain. It's somehow, you know, we have vision occurs. We have this beautiful interactive 3D dynamic holodeck reality, which we call visual perception. Now, how we get from electrochemical signals to all of this we see is a, is a big question, and it's, it's kind of just, you know, just gloss over that. Let's not talk about that, really, because it's a bit of a mystery. Um, and what throws up some more conundrums, and we're getting to the juicy bit now, is that people in, under the influence of psychedelics, when they see these geometric patterns, they, they tend to defy what we understand about perhaps what's going on. Now, the famous explanation was there was these mathematicians got together with some neuroscientists and they said, so, you know, the light comes in, it hits the back of the eye, it goes to the back of the brain, and then you've got, you've got different cells in your visual cortex which code for different orientations of lines. You've got ones that code for this kind of line and one for this kind of line. And then what happens is, according to the... There's a lot of really complex mathematics, which is brilliant. You know, you can blind people with that. And then you basically get these... Oh, and so if you, you, know, if you overstimulate these, uh, these cells in the, in the visual cortex, you're going to get all these complex geometric patterns occur, which is great. And the guy explaining this mathematician was brilliant. And <laughs> he basically said, and so you're basically seeing your own visual s structure. You're basically seeing your, the, 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 your own visual cortex. Well, how does that happen? How do you see your own visual cortex? Do you have another eye inside that's looking at your visual cortex? I mean, this is the part of the mystery. What? I'm arguing for ignorance. Well, we do have an eye in our head. It's called the pineal gland, but that's not doing the looking, I don't think. We'll come to the questions afterwards if we can, because we've got a lot to cover. But let's, yeah, let's have a discussion. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because... When people have these uh, experiences of these form constants, they see uh, not them in just, I mean, it's hard enough to explain these things in two dimensions, let alone three dimensions, but people have the experiences of them having extra dimensions, okay? So they see these geometric patterns, and they're a bit more complex than what we normally perceive. You know, they tend to fold in on themselves. They, people explain them as having more than the normal amount of dimensions. So this is a typical DMT experience. The space behind my closed eyes became almost immediately multidimensional. I can clearly see an animated domed, geometrically patterned, this is the form constants, visualization, largely made of colored patterned equilateral triangles. Um, the geometries of the structure taking place around me were not so simple, not so kiddie maths. I have done some minor readings on sacred geometry, we all have, and had not always just struck me as something that was neat maths that could produce intricate and beautiful patterns. But faced with these kinds of structures, built literally out of all these geometries in ways that boggled the mind. You know, it found it quite difficult to understand this. I'll give you another example. The wall was like a complex scaffold of constantly morphing angular prisms, shimmering with colors that are completely beyond, completely beyond the descriptions of my, any language and are totally awe-inspiring. So, you know, they, they'd be defy description linguistically. Um, this is a good one. Uh, shockwave through my body, jolting me conscious, apparent crystallization of matter all around, felt even like being within a sentient prism. All spatial perceptions seem to enfold itself into a gravity well of such ineffable density that it, ta 
is like floating on the event horizon of a black hole, a prudent observer to nothing less than a multidimensional miracle. Okay, so this is going a little bit beyond its basic conceptions. Oh, you see a 2D geometric image. I mean, people are talking <laughs> about multidimensional percepts. I won't bore you with them. But this one's a good one. It's, it's a bit of a tongue twister, and it just goes to show how difficult it is to explain these experiences. So at this point, the glorious geometrist transcended what is even vaguely feasible in this three-dimensional mundane world, constantly compressing into new and variegated permutations, exfoliating out of themselves what might be called hyperspherologies of the divine. And to look anywhere was to be shot clean through with scintillating amazement. You have a sense of being swarmed by the whimsical mastermind art forms of an extremely eccentric Boolean contortionist, a diabolical merry-go-round of linguistics, Rubik's cubes, 13th di dimensional millipedes saying themselves to themselves as they make love, and the impossible Gordian knots dancing the jitterbug at a lyrical light speed, a gelatinous ballet of endlessly self-juxtaposing pirouettes. Okay, so, you know... These are pretty, pretty wild experiences. I mean, it's quite verbose, but, you know, you get the idea. Kind of goes a little bit beyond that, okay? <laughs> so, you know, artists have, have done their best to try and represent these multidimensional percepts, you know, like, uh, I mean, it's hard enough, you know, but we've only recently discovered how to represent three dimensions in artwork, you know, in the last, you know, several centuries. But trying to represent extra-dimensional percepts is a lot more difficult. Um, more artwork from Alex Gray, a book by uh, Rick Strassman on, on DMT. Um, <clears throat> and I was looking through Rick Strassman's work and I noticed on his, he had this questionnaire he gave to his participants who he injected with DMT. And one of the questions on there was something on his hallucinogenic rating scale. I asked about the dimensionality of the images people were perceiving. Um, so, and the responses were, you know, you have normal 3D, multi-D, or beyond D, you know. So it's like, <laughs> how many dimensions do you want? And uh, I wrote to him and said, well, it would take some digging around to find out how many volunteers scored multi-dimensional or beyond dimensionality. But if my memory serves me well, nearly all the high-dose session volunteers marked either one or the other of these. So, you know, at a high enough dose of DMT, you get extra dimensions. That's just how it goes. <laughs> we don't know why. Um, so, you know, but trying to, get, trying to get neuroscientists to look at this is like, uh, you know, they're like the three wise monkeys, you know, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. I forgot what the third one was. Um, but it's an interesting question, you know, what do blind monkeys actually see on the influence of psychedelics? <laughs> this research has actually been done. I mean, it's more interesting to know what, what humans see, but let's let think there hasn't been much research on this, but there has been some research on, well, if you need your eyes, you know, if you need the, your, your working visual system to see something, then you shouldn't really perceive anything under the influence of psychedelics, right? Well, maybe. So, yeah, they had some experiments where they gave monkeys um, DMT and acid. Uh, they were blind monkeys. Unfortunately, this is a rather cruel experiment. They made the monkeys blind, which I really do not agree with. Um, and they found that under the influence of the psychedelics, that the monkeys acted like they could see, even though they were blind. Okay? So they had more uh, exploration and what they call visual tracking behavior. And one of them kept rubbing its eyes, appeared to be looking at things. What about blind people? Unfortunately, there's been no experiment that I know of but they've given DMT to blind people, but there have been experiments giving LSD to blind people um, in 1963, and they found that of uh, 24 participants, 13 of them reported visual hallucinations. They saw faces, they saw people. So people who are blind do see. What's the important question here? From birth? From birth, no. So these weren't from birth. They had visual images. Yeah, so they, 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 they knew what it was like to see, okay, originally, but they lost their sight through their life. Um, yeah, so, but they still have the, the visual uh, experience when they're blind. However, there is some research with people who are congenitally blind, i.e. blind from birth. Now, if you're blind from birth, your, your visual cortex doesn't develop for seeing. You don't even know what it's like to see. 
you, it's not like you just see light and dark. You know, it's not like you don't even know what it is to see. You have no visual, spatial representation of the world in the ordinary sense. You may have auditory, auditory spatial, you know, or taste or tactile, but visual, nada, nothing. Um, and this isn't with psychedelics, but it, it bears a close resemblance. It's people on, who had near-death experiences, people who are blind, and there's a, a bit of research done by uh, Ring and Cooper, and they asked people, blind people who'd had near-death experiences, and they interviewed them, and they found that they had 31 blind people, 80% of them reported visual aspects to their near-death experience. You know the near-death experience, the classic thing? You know, you have a life-threatening event, you generally have an out-of-body experience, uh, you may kind of find yourself floating above looking down at your body, you'll see some light, you step into the tunnel of light, you see a dead relative or an angel or whatever, and they go, go back, it's not your time, and you know, you pop back into your body. That's <laughs> pretty much how it goes, more or less. But what they found is they had 14 congenitally blind people. People have been blind since birth. And this is one of what one of them said. He said, the first thing I was aware of, that I was up on the ceiling looking, and I looked down and I saw this body. And at first I wasn't sure it was my own, but I recognized my hair. But this is somebody who's been blind since birth. I mean, how do they actually see anything? That's a good question. <clears throat> and another, she, unfortunately, being congenitally blind has its problems, and she had several near-death experiences, I assume from you know, accidents from being blind. Isn't it? And she said, these two experiences were the only time I could ever relate to seeing and to what light was, because I experienced it. So it's quite extraordinary. Uh, there's a couple of other experiences as well, quite interesting from this research. This is somebody who had very, very bad eyesight. I mean, they couldn't see without glasses. It was like extremely poor eyesight. And so from, they had this near-death experience, and they said, from where I was looking, I could look down on this enormous fluorescent light, and it was filthy. And I remember thinking, oh, I've got to go and tell, I've got to go and tell the nurses about that. Isn't that nice, domesticated? Um, and then another one said, I could suddenly see everything, the whole room, and myself in it. And I couldn't tell where I was seeing from. I wasn't seeing from my eyes or from my single point of view. It seemed to be seeing everything from everywhere. Um, there seemed to be eyes in every cell of my body and every particle surrounding me. Uh, I could simultaneously see from straight on, from above, from below, from behind, and so on all at the same time. So how is it people can see in all different directions simultaneously? People have also reported similar things on DMT. I'll skip the, the report, but so we find the kind of similarity of reports and near-death experiences, psychedelic experiences of these perceptions from omnidirectional perceptions, extra-dimensional perceptions, and perception without a working visual system. Perception in the absence of ever being able to see anything. <clears throat> anyway, I better move on. So uh, I've done some research with uh, ayahuasca users in South America. And uh, they have these experiences where they see these geometric patterns. And, and they utilize them. They call them the quenes. And they, they say they represent a kind of person's state of well-being, uh, how sick or well they are. You know. And if, if they are kind of nicely formed and geometric and symmetrical, the person is well. But broken geometry, broken symmetry represents sickness. And so you, know, you see it in all their artwork. They paint it on people's faces. And the shaman will sing the geometry back into alignment. They'll kind of, with the help of their guiding spirits, they'll sing the person's geometry straight. Okay, and then they, you know, they sing these shamanic songs, and the women will weave the, the yarns. Well, they'll, they'll actually. So this is a song. This is what a, a, an ayahuasca, a nicaro, looks like. Okay, under the influence of ayahuasca, or maybe just what it looks like anyway. It's what we call synesthesia, so experiences of, for instance, seeing sound. And we know people have been having these experiences on psychedelics for a long time. Albert Hoffman, um, Saint Hoffman, we like to call him, you know. <laughs> he, uh, he had, on his first LSD experience, he had a, a synesthesia experience, so he is beatified, uh, has become a saint. Oh, what's going on? So this is his first experience. So kaleidoscopic, fantastic images surged in on me. Uh, alternating variegated opening and then closing themselves in circles and spirals, exploding in colored fountains, 
rearranging and hybridizing themselves into constant flux. It was particularly remarkable how every acoustic perception, everything he heard, such as the sound of the door handle or a passing automobile became transformed into an optical perception. Okay, so every sound generated vividly changing image and with its own consistent form and color. So it's basically seeing sounds. And that's what these um, Shapibo artwork represents. So we did some research into this, did a survey with a colleague at Oxford. Basically, the, the, people have known about this for you know, hundreds of years that people have, well, for about 100 years, that people have psychedelic synesthesia, but no one's really done any research on it. There's been very little research on it. So we did a massive survey with the help of Erowid. We got uh, nearly 1,600 responses from people, a really big sample. And uh, you know, we asked some questions about if they'd had synesthesia under the influence of psychedelics, would they have synesthesia normally? And we came up with this nice, colorful graph. Um, and the, we found that it's actually really quite common. So this is like the percentage of people reporting uh, synesthesia under the influence of various psychedelics. So, you know, LSD is actually very common, over 55%. Who here has ever had a synesthesia experience on psychedelics? Oh, yeah, so quite a few. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, it's about half the people. So, was it LSD, probably, I imagine. There you go. Uh, ayahuasca, psilocybin. So, that, you know, tryptamines are quite good for inducing synesthesia. And then we have all these different drugs. And then down at the bottom, we have, you know, alcohol and tobacco. Uh, this also kind of correlates beautifully with the, you know, the scale of harms. Did you know this one where like the, the most dangerous drugs are kind of, you know, <laughs> are actually down here and the kind of safest ones are at the top. Um, interesting. Anyway, I won't go into that. But what we, so we looked, this is people under the influence of psychedelics, but we looked at, sorry if I'm going too fast, people who have synesthesia from birth because it's an, an, a normal congenital condition with, with about 2-3% of the population. Anybody have synesthesia naturally? Okay, yeah, so some people have it ordinarily. They're born with it, you have it your whole life, yeah. Um, and we found that the same drugs that, and we asked people, well, does it enhance your synesthesia or does it reduce it? And we found that uh, the same drugs that enhance synesthesia also induce synesthesia in people who don't have it. So we think there's a common neurochemical pathway here. You know, it's, it's probably serotonergic, but not just. Anyway, that's some real science. So I'll get back to the juicy stuff. Um, so we asked people about uh, their experiences uh, on this survey. For instance, uh, I doubted it more at first than less. Live, possibly improvised music, which heard, looked, developed the texture of a falling strand of honey, which responded with drop globs, that's the new word, of width corresponding to the tonal characteristics, pitch and volume, of each note as it was played. I guess you could file it under seeing music. Um, that's a nice, typical response. Another one here. This one's really good on the dance floor. This is more of a kind of somatic synesthesia. Bass frequencies have rotated my hips or felt like experiencing acceleration. Mid-range was an expansion of my flesh. And the higher frequencies were a twinkling that was popping above my head, but I was feeling the twinkling. So that's a very bodily experience of, of sound. The difficulty with asking people about to you know, describe their experiences is you know, language breaks down very easily. So you know, for people on ayahuasca, they kind of said things like this. Uh, <laughs> the other problem with doing these kind of surveys and asking people, you know, can you describe your experience of synesthesia on drugs, is they, they, they take you literally and they, they de try and describe their experience while they're on drugs. Uh, and they say things like this. I forgot the question, I'm high as fuck on some weed called green crack. Which doesn't really help. Um, I wish I knew what it was. Anyway, so um, anyway, we, so we found some important things about psychedelic synesthesia, and we're, we're now doing experiments. We've done some ex preliminary experiments at Imperial College in London, where we're injecting people with LSD and trying to see if they have synesthesia experiences. I'll talk about that more another time. What I'm interested in is these form constants. Is that, does anybody heard of cymatics? And you know that, yeah, Chladney plates. These are called Chladney plates after, I think it's Chladney, it's a really tricky name. Um, so it's kind of, it's, cymatics is representing sound in, in a visual form, you know, directly um, in an analog sense. So maybe if I can show you this video here, this should work. 
This is a sand sprinkled on a metal plate on top of a speaker. If you haven't seen this, it's great. <coughs> So as it changes pitch, as the pitch increases, the patterns become more complex, but they're very geometric. As you would expect, these are just pure wave tones. I'm going to stop before it explodes. Okay, you get the idea. So just let me, you can do the same thing if you just bow, you get a, a violin bow and, and get a metal plate with some sand. And Chladney came up with all these different patterns you get, which look very much like, you know, ayahuasca visions and toptics, form constants. And it's kind of struck me as something interesting. You know, in these ayahuasqueros and the, and the women make these artwork of the songs, it's like, well, are they actually seeing sound? I mean, you can see sound here. And people can see sound, but are they really seeing sound? I mean, how is that possible? It's just like uh, compressions of air molecules in waves, right? But is there some sense in which you can have a kind of direct perception? Um, anyway, let's see. So, you know, under the influence of ayahuasca, they talk about uh, singing the quenes into lime, and this is a kind of ayahuasca depiction of this kind of healing ceremony. They've got their healing entities, their, their companion spirits. The, the hummingbird, in this case, is helping weave the person's uh, geometry back into alignment. Uh, so, you know, you probably all tried ayahuasca. It's quite visually intense. People make this beautiful artwork afterwards. <clears throat> and what's kind of quite common is, you know, images of serpents, images of jaguars. People talk about this a lot. Uh, you probably heard of Jeremy Narby, who put forward this theory as an anthropologist. He went out to South America, took ayahuasca with his indigenous group, and he said, uh, he put forward this idea, you know, he said that the, people, the reason that people see so many serpents in their ayahuasca visions is because they're actually seeing DNA, you know, they're seeing this kind of representation of a, a DNA double helix. This is an extraordinary idea, I mean, really? I mean, well, okay, so yeah, you can see this intertwined kind of double helix snake, but is it really DNA? Um, and it was a kind of wild hypothesis, but let's think about this. Okay, so Kauri Mullis, you may know, won the uh, Nobel Prize. Here he is, receiving the Nobel Prize for biochemistry for developing what was called a PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Massively important in, in uh, genetic research, allowed for the Human Genome Project, allowed for forensic genetics, because you can take a small sample of DNA and replicate it. And he, he got the Nobel Prize for that. And, he, and afterwards he said, well, I, LSD was quite important in this discovery. You know, he took the LSD and he was able to develop this technique of flying alongside the strands of, of uh, DNA on a molecular level and seeing what was going on. It's allowed him to make his, his breakthrough. Um, Obviously not actually, because it wasn't, it was quite big, you know, it wasn't actually flying but, you know, in his mental imagery. It's also said that Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the DNA double helix shape, was also under the influence of LSD. This was said after his death, so we don't really know if it's true. We do know he did like LSD, and he did take it a lot, and he put on really good kind of acid punch parties. Um, <laughs> I have that on <laughs> good authority. But whether or not he took it, you know, 1953 when he discovered the shape of the DNA is, is another question. It's, we don't know. But it's an interesting idea. So Norby did the sensible thing anyway. He tried to test his idea. He took three molecular biologists to the Amazon jungle. Uh, they'd never heard of ayahuasca. They'd never been to the Amazon. Uh, but they all had a problem with their uh, genetic research. Okay, they, they'd got to a, a brick wall. You know, they had a, an issue they couldn't resolve. So we took them there, they all took ayahuasca, and you know, they all had a mind-blowing experience. They all had a breakthrough in their research. Two of them had like a worldview transformation. They changed their view on the world completely. We're no longer materialist, reductionist. 
Um, one of them said she was flying alongside the strands of DNA on a molecular level and seeing what was going on, and that allowed her to have a breakthrough in her research. So when people report this kind of weirdness, I mean, how can you actually see DNA? I mean, okay, so people do report this under ayahuasca. There are other psychedelics, they talk about going inside and seeing organs. They talk about going inside and seeing cells, going down onto an even finer level. So is it some kind of direct perception? We're talking about some kind of clairvoyance, perhaps. How can we actually test this, though? You know, it's a nice idea. It sounds pretty weird. But can we actually test this experimentally? OK, so I don't have long. So I'm going to give you my main area of research, OK, is as a parapsychologist. So I do experiments in, in ESP, extrasensory perception, primarily precognition. It's not quite the same thing as clairvoyance, but getting information from the future. So I do research on this. It's more secure. <coughs> And we have a history of this, uh, the use of psychedelic plants for psychic purposes, for transcending space and time from everywhere in the world where they use psychedelic plants. And they use psychedelic plants everywhere in the world, traditionally. <laughs> so, you know, we have the use of uh, peyote by the Varadica in Mexico, uh, psilocybin mushrooms from the Mazatecs, also in Mexico, you know, Tungus or in Siberia. Uh, they use these Amanita, red and white spotted ones. Also, she started dressing up like one. Um, you know, the other, <laughs> these are perhaps, what might this be? Okay, so uh, perhaps the Chura in India, use of Pachuri and other uh, substances. We're now discovering Acacia, DMT, used by indigenous people in Australia. Uh, Iboga in Africa, Baganam Hamala uh, in North Africa, Middle East. Uh, so many different plants in, in the Amazon. Okay, so you know, shamans have been using these things for psychic purposes, to transcend space and time, you know, for a long time, you think, thousands of years. Scientists, academics, we've discovered these things in the last hundred years, pretty much. Uh, but when we did discover these things, you know, people had these kind of experiences. So Albert Hoffman, again, apart from having synesthesia on his first uh, LSD trip, had an out-of-body experience, saw his own body. He was looking down on himself, thought he'd died. So he had an out-of-body experience, which also ties in. Uh, Humphrey Osmond, this is actually a man. Looks a bit, he's a bit old and wizened here. Um, he took an interest in, in ESP uh, and his research with psychedelics. He also turned on Aldous Huxley, uh, who also took an interest in ESP. Uh, Huxley took on the ideas of Henri Bergson, that the brain is actually not just a, a generator of consciousness, it's a filter of consciousness. And that psychedelics can allow you to turn off the filter mechanism of the brain, which allows, you know, kind of collective consciousness to come in, to uh, experience the world as it really is, infinite, you know, to access all places and spaces uh, in time and space. Um, which, interestingly, do you know about the recent psilocybin brain imaging research been doing in England? They found really surprisingly that what happens when you give people psilocybin, like me, and put them in the brain scanner, uh, is that there's less activity, there's no more activity in the brain, and in certain key regions there's less activity in the brain. And this is a, was a total surprise. Um, you'd expect, oh, you know, well, you're having this kind of wild experience and you're seeing all this stuff, there's got to be loads of kind of random stuff happening. But no, the brain is much, much quieter, which kind of ties in with uh, Huxley's ideas. Anyway, that's me in a brain scanner <laughs> on psilocybin. It's like I'm having one of those perms, you know, where you get your, get your curly hair. Um, yeah, so psilocybin, you know, when with the first uh, psilocybin mushroom cult was discovered in Mexico by these two people, um, R. Gordon Wasson and Valentina. Uh, they met this man, first of all, uh, Don Arulio, this guy. And he did a mushroom ceremony for them. And he was able to tell Wasson two things uh, that he didn't know, that Wasson didn't know, and that this man living in a mountain in Mexico shouldn't have known about his son back home. And they both were true. So he demonstrated some kind of clairvoyance. And also precognition, because one of the events hadn't even happened. So this was the very first discovery of of uh, magic mushrooms, so-called. Um, Hoffman noticed, you know, 
Paul Hoffman, you know, has his accidental LSD trip and, you know, it rather upset him. So, you know, when he, when he isolated psilocybin and psilocin from, from the mushrooms from Wasson, he had a medical doctor on hand, you know, so he, in case he had a bad trip. Uh, and he took, the, he took the strips of, you know, psilocin, psilocybin. He ate them with his research assistants. And sure enough, he started tripping again. And, uh, but this time, the doctor came over to him to, to, with a stethoscope to take his pulse. And he saw the doctor as an Aztec priest coming to cut out his beating heart, you know. So, <laughs> like, well, so Hoffman thought this was interesting, you know. He had these, <laughs> well, terrifying, but he had these Mexican visions. And he said, but also the people he gave psilocybin to also had visions of Mexican artwork, you know, Mexican temples, uh, Mexican sacred sites. And Hoffman himself suggested, well, there's something about taking the molecule itself connects you directly with, with, the, with the consciousness of the people who originally used these uh, substances. Um, anyway, that's Maria Sabina. Groff himself, he did loads of LSD psychotherapy. Basically, any, you, know, you, you do enough time doing psychedelic psychotherapy and you see these kinds of experiences on a daily basis, according to Groff. He did thousands of, 4,000 psychedelic therapy sessions. And he said people report um, past life recall, out-of-body experiences, ESP, particularly precognition, accurate remote viewing, space-time travel on a daily basis. This is occupational hazard, okay, if you're doing this research. Isn't the only one. Uh, I did some research. I looked at all the other psychotherapists, psychedelic psychotherapists of the, that era, and they all report, you know, the same kind of thing. I won't go into the details. We looked at surveys. Uh, of recreational users as well, like, you know, people who just take these things, so-called recreation, it's not always recreation, is it? Um, we looked at the kind of prevalence of, of uh, parapsychological phenomena. Um, so amongst cannabis users, they report telepathy. Up to 83% of cannabis users report having an experience of telepathy uh, <laughs> under the experience. Uh, similar results. We also find that the more psychedelics people take, the more experiences they have. So <laughs> these things clearly induce the experiences, but are these experiences real? Well, this is the question. And to that, just going through this, just more data, we have to look at experimental uh, approaches. We've got to do experiments with people. Can we actually test people for precognition under controlled uh, environments? Walter Panke, for instance, he did the Good Friday experiment. He did some ESP experiments with acid. And, you know, back in the 60s, it was all the rage. It had all these, uh, I'll go through this quite quick now, you know, these card-guessing tasks where you'd get these Zener symbols. You'd see them all, you know, circle, star, wavy line. And, you, you know, you'd do it repeatedly for maybe 20 packs of cards or, you know, for a few hours. Pretty boring, actually. But. So they did loads of experiments back in the day. This is what we call a forced choice because you're forced to make a choice of a star, wavy line, you know, that's it. Star, wavy line, cross, over and over. <coughs> and they gave people over to psychedelics in different experiments and, um, well, basically the results were a bit bad. Nothing happened. They didn't discover anything. But people kind of complained. They said, you know, it's, this is psychedelically immoral uh, to make us do this, you know. People were talking about having their first mystical rapture. Um, in fact, most of the participants in these experiments had never taken a psychedelic. So, you know, kind of welcomed into the parapsychologist's lab and, here, have a, do this card guessing task for several hours, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, those experiments didn't really work. People said they're, they're very boring. But there's another type of experiment where you get people to just say what they're, they're visualizing, okay, and then. You, with the intention of matching it to some unknown target, maybe a, uh, a picture in another room, or maybe a different location, or maybe a video clip. And those experiments, on the whole, were a lot more successful. But half of them reported positive results, which is great, but it's not really good evidence because they're all quite badly controlled by kind of modern standards. So I figured I had to do my own experiments. I began working with ayahuasca. I'm going to speed this up. You all know what ayahuasca is, I won't go into it. Interestingly, when one of the, the chemicals isolated from ayahuasca was first um, discovered it about 100 years ago in Colombia, they called it telepathine because people started having lots of these 
telepathic like experiences. I won't go into the chemistry, blah, blah, blah. I did one of these forced choice experiments where you just have to guess. You had to basically visualize a, a fractal image under the influence of ayahuasca. Um, didn't really work, okay? But it took me a long time to do that experiment and find out it didn't work. But it didn't work with people who weren't tripping either. It, in fact, people did worse um, in this experiment generally um, <laughs> when they did it a second time. So, but I did learn a few things from that of how not to do these kind of experiments. Um, started working with San Pedro instead which, you know, people have been reporting transcendence of space-time for a long time on San Pedro. Um, it's a kind of classic case here from Eduardo El Corindero. Induces the sixth sense, the telepathic sense, of transmitting oneself across time and matter. So I went to the Andes uh, to find San Pedro. I found, uh, basically my idea is you have a kind of automated, computerized, testing system based on precognition and you, you know you just take it into the ceremonies it's field research you know you get somebody's doing a kind of psychedelic ceremony and, you, and it's easy to do this you know overseas because obviously psychedelics are legal in this country uh, mostly and um, so you go into the ceremony and then you get people to do your experiment <laughs> and you know I had a hard enough job finding some shamans who would agree and this guy said yeah of course you can do your experiment and it's oh great and you're up the side of a mountain with no running water, no electricity. And then I pull out my laptop and he's like, oh no, oh no, no, you can't bring that into the, into the ceremony. So it's like, damn. Now my original ayahuasca experiment, I got 20 participants and I got them to do the experiment, the trial, one trial each, okay? And I planned to do the same thing with San Pedro, but I couldn't get anyone to do it, you know? And I thought, well, if I just get one person to do the experiment, but do 20 trials, so they do all the trials, then, you know, I've got the same amount of data. So I found somebody, and that was me. <laughs> he wouldn't agree to it, so I was like, okay, I'll do it myself. So this is an experiment with one person. It's what you call a free response precognition design. So, um, okay, my, my intention was to try and visualize a video clip, yeah. Um, so I had, a, I had pools of video clips, 20 pools, and in each pool there's four video clips, yeah? They're one minute each, and they've been selected by a research assistant, and he's selected them, and he's put them in these pools, they're all one minute, and they're made to be as different from each other as possible. And my task is to try and, try and visualize one of these video clips that is then, afterwards, selected as the target, okay? So we'd, I don't even know what the target is, yeah, um, I know it's a video clip, and I'm going to see four video clips, and I don't know which one is the target. But first, I do the visualization. Well, first, I take the San Pedro, okay? So two hours of nausea later, um, <coughs> I then do the visualization. So I'll close my eyes. I'll try and visualize the video clip, and I get some impressions, and I, I write them down. I, I verbalize them. So it has to be something I can verbalize, I can put into words. And then I see... I watch four video clips, yeah? One after the other, one minute long. Video clip, video clip, video clip, video clip. And then I rate them. I say, okay, my visualization was, wow, it was just like this, or it wasn't like that. And I rank them, I put them in order. So this one is most like my visualization, this one is not like my visualization. Is that clear so far? So, you know, we know by chance alone, okay, and then one of them afterwards is then selected to be a target by a random number generator. It's completely independent. So just a random number generator selects one as the target, okay? So my chance of picking the same one is what? I'm gonna test you now, you're back at school. Well, one in four, yeah, one in four. 25% chance that I'll get the same one as a computer just by random chance, okay? So this is how we do science in, in psychology and parapsychology. <laughs> Well, not usually with the San Pedro, okay, but. <laughs> uh, I don't know what that is. I was getting high on San Pedro, I think. I don't know. Okay, so, so this was my first visualization. Um, so I just, I just only like picked out a few things. I just, I'd only try and get a couple of things because I didn't want like loads of information, you know, and you're looking at these video clips and you don't know what, which one it is. So just try and get a couple of things, a couple of impressions. So this one was ancient Greek scene. 
eyes and a city, uh, city night on a lake. City at night on a lake, it should be. And so then the first clip was this. Anyway, it goes on for a minute. I was completely shitting myself. I don't know. Was, I was like, <laughs> the video stopped, and I was like, this, oh my God, what? It was so intense. And I realized I was really tripping. Uh, and then I also realized when I looked at what I'd written down before that I said, an ancient Greek scene. Okay, so I was like, oh, this is quite interesting. No city at night on a lake. But, you know, an ancient Greek scene, not bad. So that was just a test. I didn't even collect the date from that. But had I, I would have selected that one as, as the clip. But this is, a, is another example of ones, um, which it was the, the target. Uh, so this one is a very simple June, desert June sands of time. And there was four clips, and this is one of the clips. And this is the clip I selected. They and other snakes, like the puff adder, can also move on their ribs, lifting them up in groups and pulling the scales of the underside forward and over the rib tips. Desert, dunes, the sands of time. To me, the most mystifying technique is that used So, yeah, I, was like, I saw this one went, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that one's a target. And the others were like, you know, one was like a hippo in a bath, one was some birds flying in the sky, and it's like, this is the target. And then afterwards, there's a randomization process, and it actually selected this one as a target. So we just did this. Okay, so I won't give you any more. They weren't all as good as that, but I did get more than you would expect by chance. I'm not going to go into that. If you want the statistics, it's there, but it was a success. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to leave it there. That was the experiment. I'd like somebody to replicate this. It's just one person. Um, we need independent replication from different laboratories. So, you know, go forth and, and replicate. Um, so I'd just like to say, yeah, the science of uh, study of exceptional human experience is very small area of research, really me. Uh, <laughs> you know, come and join me. It's quite fun. Um, and these are the stuff we cover. And I think it can tell us some really important things about various stuff, okay? It tells us these experiences are actually very common. Uh, they're not necessarily delusional because, you know, people can come back with accurate information. They can be useful for personal transformation on a transpersonal level, you know. Uh, I'd like to add, based on Maria's talk yesterday, that they are femtheogenic as well, I reckon, because it's very much the kind of lunar side of science. And I think we really need to introduce this in science, you know, because science is very materialist, reductionist, mat you know, <laughs> male kind of thinking, and it, it, it's not really engaging with these kind of phenomena very well. Um, they can inform us about the neurobiology of, of these experiences, which is great. When we're looking at psychedelics. They can tell us about these experiences that people have not on psychedelics. Uh, help us understand the full spectrum of human psychology and human experience, because these are exceptional. These are on the edge of experience, but people have these experiences, and it's important to integrate them and normalize them and bring them in. Uh, it gives people, you know, it allows us to, to frame these experiences, to understand them, and um, to learn how to use these experiences. We can learn something more about them. Gives us insight into ontology. What is the nature of reality, which is the ultimate question. Uh, and I don't think it is as it just ordinarily seems. <coughs> Psychedelics give us repeatable means for exploring these experiences. As Rick Strassman said, you know, 50% of high-dose participants have entity encounters. And it can tell us a lot about consciousness and the mind-body problem. So thank you very much. Yeah.